Good evening, everybody. There's a lot of you attending this evening. That's really, really great to see. Um, and we're very lucky this evening to have Elliot Higgins, uh, the founder of Bellingcat and the Brown Moses uh, blog. Elliot has just written, We Are Bellingcat, an intelligence agency for the people. And as you will know, if you've been following the Bellingcat story, um, it is an approach to open source investigation and techniques so that we can contribute journalistic um, uh, facts and figures uh, as lay people, skilled lay people, I have to say. Um, Elliot and Bellingcat have commented on things as diverse as uh, the Skripal poisonings from war events in the Yemen and Ukraine and Syria. So what will happen this evening is that Elliot will speak for around 30 minutes or so. Um, if you have any questions, please do store them up because there'll be a Q&A session afterwards. Over to you, Elliot. Thanks, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to take you through some of the work that we've been doing at Bellingcat over the past few years. Um, Bellingcat is a website I launched in 2014. I had spent a couple of years blogging uh, under the pseudonym Brown Moses, named after a Frank Zappa song. And I wanted to launch a site that would bring together people who were already doing open source investigation, but also help people learn how to do it themselves. So here's the Bellingcat website. You see on the left hand side, we have our latest investigations. And on the right hand side, we have resources. Um, and that's to teach other people how to do open source investigation, because we find the more people doing it, the more chance there is of uh, finding the truth on a whole range of different topics. Um, open source investigation uses publicly available information. And what's really changed over the last 10 years is the availability of information online, both through um, social media sharing and um, platforms like Google Earth, Google Street View, um, and other online information that is accessible to really anyone in the world with an internet connection. So what we do is use that information to invest a variety of cases. Um, we launched Bellingcat in July 2014, just before MH17 was shot down over Eastern Ukraine, uh, killing all 298 passengers on board. And that was one of our first major investigations. So um, as we um, kind of grew as an organization, starting as a crowdfunded organization with one employee, um, we grew a community around the uh, of volunteers who got involved in a variety of investigations. And I'm, what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a series of investigations that started out uh, in 2018, uh, following the poisoning of Yulia and Sergei Skripal in Salisbury, obviously a very well-known case where they had gone to an Italian restaurant in Salisbury, felt extremely unwell, started walking home uh, until they eventually collapsed on a park bench. So um, at that point, Bellingcat, we didn't really have much to go on. There wasn't much open source information, but more events unfolded afterwards. So for example, the poisoning of Charlie Rowley and Dawn Sturgis, who sadly died after being exposed to Novichok, after Charlie Rowley found a uh, pox of perfume uh, dumpster diving, and that perfume was actually uh, filled with Novichok. And Dawn Sturgis, thinking it was perfume, sprayed it on her wrist and died. Um, from Novichok exposure. Now this is a nerve agent that's known to be linked to the Russian Federation, so there's obviously suspicions that Russia was behind this. And uh, a few months after that incident, there was uh, information released by the UK authorities pointing towards two suspects, Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Boshrov, both Russian citizens. They had flown into Salisbury, uh, into London, um, taking the train down to Salisbury on the day of the poisoning. Uh, they claimed uh, in a Russia Today interview, um, shortly after this information was released, that they were actually visiting Salisbury for its famous 123 meter spire, and they were nothing but innocent sports nutrition salesmen. Um, but this started making us interested. We want to know who these people were. And um, this is an example of just some of the tools that we're using in an open source investigation. This is a summary of you know, the social media platforms we explore, the different kind of search tools we have. If you wanna see the tools that we use, you can use the bit.ly link at the bottom to um, visit uh, our actual online toolkit. We try and make as much of this as public as possible. Um, and that allows, will allow you to you know, even give it a go yourself. So one thing that was very useful is that a, um, in Russia, there's basically a black market for data. Anything that the government has, you can basically buy on the internet because Russia from the top to the bottom is extremely corrupt and the bureaucracy is extremely corrupt. And there's been for years and years, a black market for data. 
And we managed to acquire the flight records for one of the actual the flight that the two suspects were on. And it provided details, not just of the flight, but also when it was booked. Now, in their Russia Today interview, they were claiming that they, had, they were on a long planned holiday. But what you can actually see here is the booking information from those two individuals. And they both booked it at eight o'clock on the previous evening, uh, which you can see on the top line here. That's their online booking. And then they flew out the following morning. So it was not a long planned trip, as they had claimed. It was something that was arranged at very short notice. So that was obviously immediately suspicious. So something else that was extremely suspicious is because we had these flight details, we also had the other details about them. For example, their passport numbers, which were very unusual because they're only a few numbers apart. Now, if these are two separate individuals who've applied for their passports, then there's a virtually zero chance that these numbers would be this close together. So this was also extremely suspicious. Now, we were also able, using this data black market in Russia, to purchase the actual passport files for these two suspects. These are the registration forms they use when they're applying um, for their passports. And these were very unusual because there were a few details that stood out. Um, we could see, of course, first straight away that these were uh, you know, the same people. You could even see things like kind of the mole on his uh, chin, the shape of his ears, aside from the fact they obviously are the same person. Um, but the second page of this form was blank, which is very unusual because this is where you put the data about previous passports. And someone at the age of these people who looks around the, you know, the, in their thirties probably would have had a passport before. Um, but for some reason that page was blank. And the, on the uh, first page, it was claimed that the passport was unusable. Um, there was also a very unusual stamp, which uh, had a phone number on it. And this phone number is actually the phone number of the Russian Ministry of Defense. And it's telling people to call this number if you're looking at this passport form. So this also is extremely suspicious. We also looked at their flight records, which again was accessible by, you know, through this kind of black uh, data market in Russia. We showed us many of their journeys. And this started becoming a bit of a process for us. As these kind of cases went on, we learned more and more about different information you could find. We also discovered there were an awful lot of databases that were leaked online from the Russian government. So house registration databases, car registration databases, tax databases, and we started collecting those. And we now have several hundred of these databases for towns, cities, and regions across Russia, giving us that kind of information. Now, we were thinking how we could figure out, you know, what these real identities were of these people. And the clue actually came um, from an attempted coup in Montenegro uh, a couple of years earlier. Now, one Q suspect was actually arrested and he had two identity documents on him. It was the same person, but two different identities. And the first name uh, was the same. This patronomic, the second name was very similar. Uh, and the third name was kind of similar as well, which was odd. But also the date of birth and this place of birth was exactly the same. So we started thinking maybe if we search through all these databases we have, we can find some combination of name, um, date of birth and place of birth that will match to other people on the database. So we're looking for someone who would match the identity of these two suspects to a certain degree. So that's what we started doing. The other thing that was very interesting about this person was his fake passport number, because we had the first two numbers from the uh, Scripple suspects, but this guy's passport number was only about 26 numbers different from the other two. So we came to the conclusion that these must be false identities that had been issued sequentially, which sounds kind of really dumb on the face of it. Why would you do that? But they'd be getting away with this, obviously, for quite some time without getting caught. So we started looking into Alexander Petrov. And we looked at the re registration form that we had for him. And we had some details, his place of birth, uh, his date of birth, and his first name and his patronomic. So we put lugged this into those um, online databases. Uh, and the offline information that we had collected as well. And so this is an example of one of them, the 2013 St. Petersburg Residence Database. And we discovered an Alexander Mishkin with the same date of birth, who also lived in uh, St. Petersburg. And he had a, an interesting address because this apartment building that he lives in is across the road from the academy of the, uh, uh, basically the medical academy of the Russian military. And we also got his telephone number, which proved to be useful because we then searched for that on another database and we discovered more details about him and where he was uh, actually work, working at that time in 2013, the St. Petersburg Military Medical Academy. And we've used that phone number to find um, the car registration um, for his car. So this is basically from the online phone directory where we searched for his phone number that gave more information that led us to an online 
uh, car insurance database and his make and model of car, which was the Volvo XC90. We looked that up in the 2013 car registration database, uh, where in 2012 he had been registered to St. Petersburg, and then in 2013 he had moved to Moscow and registered the car there. And he had registered it in the according to the 2013 uh, database to a specific district in Moscow, which just happened to be the same district that GRU headquarters was in at the address listed here. And when we looked into uh, 2014 car registration database, which again was one that we just managed to find online, um, his full address was there, which was the same address as this, this is GRU headquarters. Now you might think that's really silly that someone would, you know working as a spy would register their um, car to the headquarters of the spy agency but that's not unique because if a couple of years ago there was this guy arrested uh, as part of a GRU team trying to hack the OPCW in The Hague in the Netherlands um, they were arrested and uh, again their identity documents were published online by the uh, Dutch authorities this time and we managed to identify where he lived and uh, his other details and his car was also registered to a GRU headquarters, this time in St. Petersburg. And what you're actually seeing here are just some of the other people who also registered their car to the same headquarters. And in fact, there were 305 people who had registered their car to this one uh, building, this GRU headquarters in St. Petersburg, showing that this is actually quite a widespread practice. And we believe this is because what they're trying to basically get out of um, traffic fines. And if they get pulled over when they're drunk driving, the police officer will leave them out, out alone once they run their number plate. Uh, it's one of the perks of the job, I guess you could say. So we had discovered that Alexander Petrov was in fact Alexander Mishkin. And uh, we even managed to acquire again from these uh, Russian data services uh, a copy of what his own passport. This is his real passport, an old copy of it um, from quite a few years ago. And we then went to um, a university who did facial imagery analysis just so we could be 100% sure to compare the two images. Um, and as you can see here at the bottom is the percentage match. Anything above 70% is considered reliable. So as you can tell, this was quite significant. Now, we also decided to look at the place he was born. And the place he was born um, was this tiny little town uh, in the north of Russia. Now, this is really remote. You cannot get to this place by car most of the year because it is too swampy. Um, so there's a single gauge uh, rail line in and out of it once per day. And our colleague um, from a Russian uh, outlet called The Insider went there to talk to the locals. And this is what the place looks like. This is like the high street. Um, it's extremely rural. It's really in the middle of nowhere. Very few people live there. This is a typical mode of transport in the location because the ground is so poor. Um, but in fact, when our colleague went there, he was shown the photograph of this guy around and lots of people said, yes, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's Alexander, our hero. He's a hero of Russia. And it turns out he'd been awarded the Hero of Russia Award, which is the highest honor you can get in Russia. Um, and that was apparently for something he did in uh, related to Ukraine in 2014, according to local people. In fact, his grandmother apparently had a photograph of him receiving the award from Putin, but she refused to show it to our journalists, but all the local people said they had seen it because she was quite proud of it. So we started looking into the second suspect. Now, this guy was a bit trickier because when we'd use this same trick of using the same date of birth, place of birth and first name, there were no results in any of the databases we were looking for. So we were um, stumped at first, but then we thought we'd kind of create a profile of him. If he was a GRU officer, which seemed extremely likely because his friend was, where would he have been trained? What kind of details we, would we need? So we started coming up with this profile about him. Um, and to figure out which school he would be going to, and that would be the Far Eastern Military Command Academy, probably between 2001 and 2003. Then using various online resources, including the Academy's own website, we started digging through, looking for information about them. And it turned out there are actually seven graduates from the school who were bestowed the Hero of Russia Award. So we actually started looking into those um, seven people, six of whom were actually um, available, you know, they had social media profiles, we could find them, right? they were easy to find, but one guy didn't. Um, Colonel Antoly Chapiga didn't exist on the internet whatsoever. And the other six guys were definitely not the guy from the Scripple poisoning because we could tell because we had their photographs on their social media pages. So we looked them up in the 2003 residential database and it's listed the military unit he was actually registered to at that time. 
and it was actually a Spetsnaz uh, unit of the GRU. So we had this GRU connection between this uh, Antonio Chapiga uh, and uh, the GRU uh, uh, unit number. So we wanted to look into him a bit more. What could we find about him? Was he the same guy we were looking for? So we found him again in a 2012 residential database. Um, in fact, we discovered he had the same date of birth as Ruslan Bosharov. So there was one connection. Obviously, if you're going to look through Russian databases with just a date of birth, it's going to take you a long time to find it. But this was another connection uh, between the two individuals. And again, we managed to get passport details, the forms that were available. And all of this, again, is openly available. The kind of people who normally use these data services are people who get phone records of their husbands to find out if they're cheating or are trying to co commit some sort of fraud. It's used basically by criminals and uh, angry lovers. So um, we were using it for journalism, which was something very different. But we got his identity documents the 2003 passport of Antalya Chapiga, the 2009 passport of Ruslan Bosharov when he registered his form, and the 2018 uh, passport image. And again, they were the same people. We again did analysis of the individuals. We um, you know, did three different kinds of analysis with a professor who is a specialist in this. And there was an extremely high match between these two guys. And in fact, as we started digging more and more, we went to the website of the unit and um, realized they had tours of their, they had a military museum there. And we found people who visited the military museum and on their wall with, for the heroes of Russia was his photograph and his name. Um, and even though it wasn't the clearest photograph in the world, you could see it was pretty much obvious that it was the same person. So, um, Later on, there was reporting there was actually a third individual who traveled with them, a Sergei Fedotov. He was identified because he flew on an earlier flight the day the two suspects flew, but his passport number again was very close to the passport number of the other two suspects. So we started digging into him. Uh, we knew he had flown in a few hours beforehand. Um, we started getting his data, border crossings, all kind of information about them, every single, and this is all stuff that, you know, again, Russia, you can buy as much as you want. So we started doing searches um, for this person, trying to figure out who it could be. What was really interesting is his residential place, uh, database li listed his place of birth as uh, uh, this location here, but he just didn't exist there. He apparently had been purged from the databases. He had also been employed by Business Courier, which is a company that just existed on paper and never traded. So this again, immediately started to look like a fake identity. We even found his home address according to the databases, but when we call, called up the house, um, the people answering the phone had no idea who we were talking about. Other journalists actually visited the same address, knocked on the door, and it was clearly not Fedotov's family or anyone who knew anything about him. So we also acquired uh, a copy of his passport. It was issued by the same passport desk as the other two Skripal suspects. And this is a passport desk that is used by the military and VIPs. Um, we, again, we had the passport form that we had before and it had the same reason why there was an earlier version of the passport on it. But what was interesting is there's a previous passport listed that's supposed to exist, um, but it wasn't any of the databases. It actually looked like, as we were digging through, we were getting, we were trying to get copies of this passport because it had been used, it appeared on other databases, but when we were looking for it, it just didn't seem to exist anywhere. We actually even used two sources to confirm this because this was very unusual because the implication was quite serious. It was that the um, someone had to have gone in and removed that from multiple databases. So it must have been that the um, Russian authorities did that because they're the only kind of people with the authority to go in and start deleting data from the Russian passport databases. Finally, though, we managed to get a photograph of him. And unfortunately, it wasn't much. Here's the actual photograph we acquired. It was from a border crossing. As you can tell, it's low resolution, very blurry. It's not just your monitor playing up. Um, so we started then trying to recreate his real identity. We started using combinations of his first name, his patronomic, and his date of birth. And we went through variants of it until we found one likely candidate with the same patronomic and the same date of birth. Denis Sergeyev, and we started looking into him. Surprise, surprise, his house, his uh, home restoration was at another GRU facility. So this is something that we find time and time again, literal spies registering their home addresses in Russian databases at the GRU. And we searched through 
everywhere we could find for an image of him. And eventually we found, and this took a lot of searching, a video from a conflict Russia was involved with about 30 years ago that actually featured um, Sergei as a soldier who was injured in the fighting there and gave an interview. And obviously he looked quite different because it was many years ago. So we went back to the facial recognition um, specialist and he said that there was a 78.2% chance that this was the same person. Um, even though the image quality was very low, this is very difficult to get a co uh, confidence of this level with this quality of Im imagery. So this is a very high chance that this is the same person. And you can see little details like his ear shapes are the same and kind of stuff like that. And his hairline is not too dissimilar either. We also got his phone data, his phone metadata. Um, and this is something, again, available on the Russian uh, kind of data markets. And this isn't just who he's called, but every single cell phone tower his phone connected to. And a modern telephone is constantly connecting to every single cell phone tower that you're walking by. So these numbers represent the number of times he was connecting to different towers as his phone was communicating, sending data, making phone calls, just pinging back and forth on the cell phone towers. And it allowed us to track him from the airport to his hotel. We also managed to get all these flight records and he was flying all over the place. And one that was particularly interesting was a trip um, to, um, in uh, 2015, um, because he traveled to Bulgaria. And on the dates he traveled to Bulgaria, a Russian, uh, a Bulgarian arms dealer, Emilian Gebrev, fell extremely ill, uh, as did his business partner and his son. They'd been traveling together uh, on a business trip and then fell very ill. And we started looking into this. And it, this connection between Gebrev and one of the Scripple, uh, seemingly one of the team involved with the Scripple poisoning, got the interest of the UK authorities and the Bulgarian authorities. And the Bulgarian authorities discovered there was CCTV camera footage from the day that the uh, Gebrev was poisoned that showed a very shady looking guy walking into the parking garage where um, immediately Gebrev had parked his car. You can see him here wearing black gloves a hat that's been pulled down, apparently sunglasses as well. He walks into the garage. He walks up towards the car of Emilian Gebrev as they're looking around. He then disappears beside the car. He's, he leaves there for about a minute and then he reappears. And as he's walking away, he's looking back at the car. And we believe this is actually where the poison was applied. In fact, it turned out as we dug into this, we found a team of several GRU officers who had traveled um, to Bulgaria um, on this day, and they'd specifically asked at the hotel they stayed at for a room that overlooked this parking garage. Now, this weekend, there's even been more news related to this case, because this is a, um, a Czech arms depot that exploded mysteriously in 2014. It has been announced recently that, in fact, the two Scripple suspects were the two people who were last to visit this location. They had asked, uh, they had posed as buyers of uh, munitions and provided fake identity documents from Moldova and Tajikistan. And um, they had posed as arms dealers, gone to the compound, and then the place had exploded, killing two people. And it just happens that the owner of that compound was a median, uh, or the ammunition was a median Gebrev. And this was very important for us because for a long time, we couldn't figure out what the motive was for this. We had our suspicions, but it's believed the weapons in that warehouse were destined for Ukraine. And this is, was at a moment where the EU and US had uh, ceased sending weaponry over to Ukraine. And it seems Emilian Gebrev was sending weaponry over there and he had been targeted by the GRU because of that, both destroying the weaponry he was selling and also trying to murder him. So where did the poison come from? Well, this is something we also discovered because around the time these operations were taking place, um, we, had, we were able to get the phone records of these individuals. And some of these individuals were phoning um, a number of numbers of other GRU officers, people who appeared to be their commanders, and scientists. Scientists who we started looking into, we identified them. Now, this process of identify, identifying them is you have a phone number and then you've got to search everywhere on the internet for places this phone number might pop up. Fortunately, in Russia, there's um, phone uh, book sharing apps, address book apps, where you basically get an app and you can type in a phone number and then you type in the name of the person it belongs to and that gets sent to a central server and you're actually then if you register you use the same app and you type the number in you get the name coming up straight away which is really handy if you're you know 
it auto populates but for us it's brilliant because people will put stuff in like uh, Sergey GRU as the phone number um, and in this case they were writing down the names of these scientists and the scientists were very interesting because they were all involved with the um, secret Russia uh, secret no uh, chop program that had been shut down uh, when Russia joined the Chemical Weapons Convention. And these scientists, we discovered uh, there were several of them, had been moved to three different in scientific institutes, supposedly producing sports nutrition. And around the time of the assassinations in Bulgaria and the assassinations in um, the scripple poisoning, they had been calling these people up. This got really interesting when uh, the opposition leader Navani, who was poisoned in August 2020, because we looked at the phone records of the scientists and discovered they'd been calling not GRU officers this time, but people who were part of the FSB. And we started piecing together what had happened. And we discovered that there was in fact a team of several FSB officers who had been working together. Um, they'd been called by these scientists, they had called them, they were calling each other. They had actually been following uh, Navalny, not just off on the trip he was poisoned, but on 40 separate trips. And this is a representation of just some of these trips. The white lines are where Navalny's traveling and the various colored lines are when um, these FSB team members have been following him. And these are the trips around the time that he was actually poisoned. Um, we in fact had all kinds of data on this. We had their phone records, which gave us the cell tower locations of their phones, which showed that they were actually very close to the, the hotel he was staying at on the night he was poisoned. We discovered in fact that in July 2020, his wife had fallen mysteriously ill on a trip where they'd been followed. It was a kind of romantic getaway, but she felt very ill. Um, and it seems that she was accidentally poisoned or put on, poisoned on purpose on that trip. Um, we also discovered by looking at the travel records of these individuals that they had poisoned other people, sometimes successfully. So these are three individuals that they had followed who had died in mysterious circumstances. The guy on the left hand side, he was actually uh, part of the official opposition in Russia. He was the official anti-corruption politician in Russia. Um, but he, he, he kind of um, got out of line and then he died under mysterious circumstances on a trip where he was being followed by this FSB team. Two guys on the right, they were actually um, very minor activists. They were kind of um, local activists who were more interested in issues to do with kind of language rights for um, you know, ethnic groups in the area. And they were both, uh, they both died under mysterious circumstances, uh, both with injection marks in their armpits when they were discovered, supposedly from heart attacks according to the official investigations, one of which was actually done by the same FSB team who appears to have murdered him. Um, and we also discovered that another very uh, well-known figure in um, Russia, Vladimir Karamurza, who was a friend of Boris Nemstov, was also followed by the same team uh, prior to him falling into a coma in 2015 and 2017, um, which again appears to be another poisoning. We're currently looking into more of these incidents with at least five more that we'll be publishing on uh, in the coming weeks. And it does seem that there has been a systematic campaign in Russia um, by the FSB to assassinate people who are problems for um, basically the Russian government and not even people who are really big problems, even people who are quite minor figures. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, that's this kind of story of what we've done with Bellingcat. So uh, thank you very much and hope you enjoy that. Thank you very much, Elliot. That was absolutely stunning. Um, I mean, I've kind of, I, I've read the summary of your work, but to see the, the the detail of how you've gone through each thing has been absolutely stunning, amazing. Um, we have a question here from Arjan Gaveka, who I'm going to try and put you on, Arjan, so that you can answer the question yourself. If I don't manage to do that, then that's okay. I'll just um, ask on your behalf. I'm going to try and unmute you. Okay, I can't. Um, uh, we've got a comment from Joe Brody um, to all panelists saying absolutely amazing, echoing the way I feel about it too. Arjan, I can't get you on. I'll ask the question on your behalf, and it's something that tantalised me as well. Is um, he says, Elliot, why are you better in finding this intelligence than Western security agencies, or do they have this information as well and are just not sharing it? Well. Um... <sighs> It's hard to tell because we, you know, don't have any particular insight. But in one case uh, we looked into that I, I didn't list here, but was another Russian assassination. There was a um, uh, a murder uh, a year or two ago in Berlin where a guy rode up to someone on a bicycle and shot them, and then rode off, and then threw the bike in a canal. But he was spotted and arrested. 
we started looking into him and discovered he was actually um, part of the um, FSB, um, traveling under a fake identity. But we were actually asked, and this is actually um, the trial's ongoing at this moment, and we expect to hear the result in um, next month, but we were asked actually to basically be key witnesses because we had discovered stuff that the official investigation, and it appears the uh, German intelligence services, had not actually discovered themselves. Um, so there, there is certainly, I, I think part of it as well is we can... Um, do stuff legally speaking that um, in the public interest that actually I believe some intelligence agencies can't do. Like buying, you know, using those services by, to buy the information is in some countries mm -hmm. not something the intelligence agencies are actually allowed to do. So we end up with this kind of weird advantage. Plus, we are very knowledgeable about open source investigation, and we've now spent three years working on these investigations. So my colleagues who've worked on this have an immense knowledge of this stuff, and this the events of the weekend have proved and that you know there can be bits of new information that pop up that suddenly tie together a lot of things that we didn't understand um and keep in mind with for example the gebrev case that was just one trip that these G this gru team went on and there's many many other trips you know they went to the uh you know they kept visiting the anti-doping agency in uh, switzerland which uh, became um you know we know from the documentary icarus was targeted by uh, the russians there's so much that was going on um you know that we probably don't even know about yet and that is, you know, you do wonder how much the intelligence agencies know. And when stuff like pops up like this, where we seem to, you know, be revealing information that hasn't been made public, you do have to kind of <laughs> ask quite a few questions about how much do they actually know about these things. And it's very easy to look at these cases and think, wow, they're really severe, they keep getting caught. But there's clearly plenty of examples of where they've got away with stuff. And it's only because they've made kind of a mistake in one case that it's kind of just blown the whole things open. If, you know, if people had believed, believed Sergei Triple had a heart attack, we still wouldn't know about any of this stuff. We wouldn't know even know about the Navalny poisoning because that's what took us to the nerve agent program that linked to the Navalny program. Um, the next question is from uh, Laura Brown, and I'm having a hard time switching um, switching you on, Laura Brown. Uh, just to note that sometimes old versions of Zoom mean that uh, it's difficult for me to put you on to listen. I'm sorry to speak. So ask the question on your behalf. She says, have the Russians or others changed the way they do things in response to your investigations? Uh, for example, not giving false passport numbers in sequence. I was wondering about that in relation to birth dates as well, because you can see it's tremendously useful for someone not to have to remember a new birth date but I'm guessing by now they're on to that one. Yeah, I mean, we've seen Russia kind of reacting to our investigations for quite a while. For example, um, with MH17, we used R Russian soldiers' social media profiles to piece together all sorts of information about MH17 and Russia's involvement in the conflict in Ukraine. So Russia actually passed a law to make that illegal to share that sort of information from soldiers on social media. That's now legal to do that in Russia. So that was this clear reaction to shutting down what we were doing. With this um, stuff we've done on the um, investigations, I mean, one thing I mentioned is how they deleted um, uh, Fedotov's passport, for example, uh, from the Ross passport database. And that seems to be their attempt to stop us finding it. But we notice the gaps. So we can tell when they've been covering stuff up. Another example is when we, I showed you those passport for, forms with the photographs of the two scripple suspects. Well, um, we saw that sequence and thought, why don't we get all the other passport forms? And, you know, this isn't cheap to do. And, we, you know, it was like a week after we made the initial publication where we revealed we had got this. But when we looked at the other forms in that sequence, they'd removed all the photographs of it. So that told us even more certainly that these were fake identities. We just didn't have the photos. And then we started looking into, uh, we published them out that, and we went and got another one of these forms later on, and they'd actually changed the photograph on the form. And we know they changed the photograph because they changed the photographs from a man's photograph to a woman's photograph for some reason. But we think this was their attempt to kind of not fall into the trap of revealing that they're actually a spy by still having a photograph on there, just the wrong one. But for whatever reason, they, the photograph they chose was a woman's photograph. So we do see these attempts to shut down what we're doing. The problem Russia is ha has is that the databases that we've collected already are offline. We have copies of them. There's hundreds of them. So they can't change those. They can go around deleting as much as they want from the live databases, but we have the old databases that have this missing information on there. So 
if there's a gap in the live database that we discover, then that's a spy. It becomes kind of more and more obvious as they try and cover it, more, you know, try these different ways of trying to cover it up. So um, it doesn't, I mean, it hasn't stopped us. I mean, we've started with the Scripple case and we're still kind of discovering the um, FSB team behind the Navalny poisoning. The funny thing is there, they don't even use the same date of birth. They use the date of birth that's exactly one year different from their actual date of birth. And they also, for their second names, were using the maiden names of their wives and girlfriends. So, I mean, it wasn't the best it's system for kind of fake identities, but it worked. I mean, they've killed, you know, a number of people and they got away with it. It's just now because it might seem dumb now, but it's, they got away with it when they were doing this stuff. Um, Joe Brody, who uh, was very impressed, um, has got a question here, which she is happy for me to read out. She said, <laughs> this is a good question. Is someone going to turn this into a film? It's an incredible story. Um, and she also echoes something that a lot of people have asked. Uh, how worried are you uh, about the, the safety of you and your team? Well, um, one thing we're doing at the moment is uh, we've, we're launching a production company for Band and Cat because, as you can imagine, we get quite a few inquiries about you know documentaries and stuff based about mm, yeah. So the first project we're working on is turning all this Russian spy stuff into like a six-part kind of Netflix-style series, um, which we're kind of very excited Fantastic. about putting together. Um, we have been approached by uh, people about turning some of this stuff into drama series, but we want stuff we're doing to be extremely authentic because we don't want to turn it into some kind of, you know, someone playing me in front of a computer with loads of screens and lights and stuff, because it's, it's literally just people, normal people in their laptops. Um, so we're, we're kind of open to that and we have been asked about it. It's just kind of find the right people. As for our safety, yeah, I mean, there's been an escalation from Russia against us over the years. It started really with the kind of, you know, Russian state media like Sputnik and Russia Today going after me personally quite a lot. They like sent someone to Leicester once and doorstep my mother because of stuff I've been publishing about Russia, which was not a pleasant experience. Um, then Russian officials started making allegations against us. First, um, it started off kind of with 2015 onwards with these kind of like Russian foreign ministry officials saying that we're using fakes and people shouldn't trust us. Um, then in 2018, when we kind of had the Scripple source story, I mean, that was always ongoing, but then it escalated to the Russian ambassador to the UK giving a press conference where he repeatedly said that we were part of the British deep establishment, as he put it, and paid for by the intelligence services. Fortunately, one of the journalists in the audience challenged him on that, and he, he was like, oh, I can't show you any evidence of that, I'm sorry. Um, so that was quite nice of him. Um, but it, it's just been escalating. I mean, like now, a recent article, for now they're currently saying that we actually sympathize with terrorists and shouldn't be trusted because in the um, uh, Berlin bicycle assassination case, the person who was shot, Russia considers a terrorist. Um, and I imagine that you I've, forget that from the Syria conflict too, because there's a great deal of sort of naming, you know, and Ukraine actually, according to where your sympathies lay, what people's motivations were. Yeah, I mean, we, we, one of the other reasons they said we sympathize with terrorists is because we, on our serial work, we use information that the White Helmets has kind of gathered. And therefore, in the eyes of Russia, you know, the White Helmets are literally terrorists preparing chemical weapons attacks and to fake and stuff like that. Um, you know, we've uh, also, I, I've been contacted by the British counterterrorism police who, you know, are in contact with me to make sure that I'm kind of ha happy and safe. This work does attract all kinds of kind of weirdos and conspiracy theorists as well. So they're as much of the threat as kind of like the GRU. But it's like now when I'm traveling, if I'm at a hotel, I won't eat food in the hotel. I won't get like room service or eat at the restaurant, um, which is very sad for me, obviously. But I'll, I'll go out and go to the local supermarket and get something to eat. Because even if I really want to eat something at that hotel, just I just can't like in my head I'm just thinking if I feel slightly unwell afterwards for any reason I would think oh yeah. this is it the GI it got me so I just can't do that anymore and we just have to be you know in our own kind of personal space as well just be very aware of our environment and making sure that there isn't anything shady going on. Yes I don't think I would take room service in your position either um I'm sorry I really can't I can't switch anybody on this evening uh, it may well be that the problem's at, at my end but I'll carry on asking the questions because they're coming in thick and fast um here's one from Sarah Vaughan um are known FSB agents allowed into Britain for the value of tracking them or are we just too slow to catch them at borders also what can you do to uh, find and track can the Russians be equally aware of your work but just feel impervious to repercussions well, I, I think there's 
two kind of points there. One, I think these people are traveling on identity documents. These are documents officially issued by the Russian state. So there's no reason to suspect that these people are Russian assassins until they you know, mess up and get caught. So I'm sure there's plenty of these fake identities being used all over the place or have been. I, I think now, you know, there's that sequence of passport numbers that I don't think anyone's ever going to use again in the future. So they might be issued new fake identities, but if I was the Russian intelligence services, I would assume that every single person with one of those passports has been identified by, you know, every intelligence agency in the world at this point. Um, the other side of it is, well, um, the, the things that they do get away with this and they get away with it, first of all, you know, because we don't find out about it. But even when we do find out about it, like in the case of the scriffle poisoning, what's happened with Navani, all these other assassinations, the explosion in the Czech explosion, all this stuff. It never really seems like there's a price that is attached to that that Russia isn't willing to pay. Having some diplomats expelled is part of the price Russia is more than willing to pay. That is zero consequences in Russia's mind. Some sanctions against people who've already moved their money outside of you know, the EU or the US back into Russia doesn't matter to them a bit. And really, this is about Putin and his cronies. So unless they're kind of targeted by the sanctions and it has real impact, they don't care. They will keep killing. They will keep doing this kind of stuff. And it worries me because Russia is, I, I am sure, convinced that Bellingcat is part of the intelligence services. I've heard anecdotally through a number of people I know working at places like the UN, for example, that when Bellingcat is raised up, Russia, even in private conversations, will say Bellingcat is part of MI6 or part of the intelligence apparatus. And they will bring this up not and they, they clearly believe it from what I've been told. And, you know, they say this, you know, they say this to rooms full of journalists. Um, so in the eyes of Russia, Balinkat is the intelligence services and Balinkat is exposing all these nasty operations they're doing. And yet they're not really being punished for them. So how does Russia kind of understand that is my problem? Because if they think they are being exposed for these assassinations, but then they aren't being punished for it, in their mind, it's, they must think that the West must kind of just accept this that they aren't going to do anything about it. And then that puts even more people in danger, I think, because it makes Russia think that they can get away with this anytime they want. The other peculiar thing about that is that you are incredibly clear about your methods. Um, and it includes, uh, it includes being very frank about a, a weakness in the Russian state, which is that you can buy information, that it's incredibly corrupt. So, I, I mean, I can see them thinking perhaps you're a propaganda arm, but it would be hard for them to claim that you were, you know, you were using special information because you've just explained to us this evening how freely available this information is if somebody's diligent enough to put it together. Yeah, and with the Navalny case, one thing we did, because we um, knew it would be a very high profile story and Russia would immediately accuse of, us of getting the information from the CIA or something, we actually did an article explaining exactly how we found the information, what kind of sources we were using. We didn't link directly to the sources because that would, you know, that, I think that's literally illegal in Russia to do that, but we explained how we did it. And then Russia anyway came out and said, well, Bellingcat is working for MI6 or MI5 or, you know, depending on who was speaking, it's three different letters. Um, but then um, Russian journalists used those same sources that we were using to buy the same data that we had brought and said, no, actually all the stuff's here, it's all available to buy. So that was really useful for us because even though we weren't able to link directly to the source like we would with a kind of traditional open source investigation, it was still available enough that anyone who wanted to spend the time to find it didn't have to put that much effort in to actually get it. And they got it and they confirmed our findings. And because this was Russian media and not even kind of independent Russian media, but even some quite kind of state friendly Russian media, it really undermined the case that this Russian government was trying to make that this data could have only come from a spy agency. Um, there's an interesting question from uh, from Judy Head, and she said, uh, do you think that these open databases will start to close down as governments globally want to become more secretive? Are these your glory years? Um, well, I, I think the thing with Russia is that they're quite unique in the way that all this information is publicly available. We haven't seen that kind of scenario in other places. Um, and they are trying to crack down on it because, but the problem is that to really solve the problem, they have to get rid of most of the corruption in Russia, which is just not going to happen because that's what, you know, Putin and his friends thrive on. Um, on the other side, there's also different kinds of information, you know, publicly available sources that are getting shut down. So, you know, like conflict videos, for example, there was a period from, you know, basically from the start of the Arab Spring till about 2014, where there's all kinds of different content on YouTube coming from conflict zones. And Google was quite happy that this was being used to kind of 
get the word out of these atrocities that were happening. But then ISIS turned up and started doing atrocities of their own and posting them on social media. And that caused this big reaction where now conflict footage is often quite frequently removed, particularly if it shows anything particularly graphic or anything that is bas vaguely kind of jihadi that is gone very, very quickly from social media sites. And for those of us who rely on this information, it can be rather frustrating. And it actually starts changing our relationship in, in a way, in a relation to, um, in a way, the accountability for these acts. Because organizations like Bellingcat, in a way, become the first line of response to this content when it's shared online. So there's now a pressure for us to start archiving this material and do it in a way that's actually useful for future human rights investigations. Because the work we're doing now is taking, being taken very seriously by the organizations like the International Criminal Court with the question of how to use open source evidence and um, preservation of it as it's being shared online is extremely important. Um, and because this information is now being taken offline by various governments because they're trying to protect the public, it mm -hmm. means that we're now in a position where we're the ones who have to preserve this. And we're, you know, we've got the whole internet and we're a tiny little organization. So we try, we're trying to build tools and techniques to both archive this information and actually do investigations to a standard that can be used for justice and accountability that can be shared with other organizations because I believe, you know, the nature of the internet itself is very decentralized and we need to kind of lean into that when we're building something. If we try and do everything as Bellingcat, then lots of stuff is never going to get done on things that are really worth doing. But if we can spread these tools and techniques to a range of different organizations, then there's a much better chance that incidents across the world that are worthy of being investigative, worthy of accountability will be investigated. Um, Zoe uh, Barrick says, um, have government security services ever paid Bellingcat for investigation? No, I mean, we're very strict on what kind of money we take as well. I mean, it's, it's you know, Bellingcat grew from, uh, you know, a crowd kickstarted website with £60,000 uh, raised to, you know, getting grants and different kinds of money. And we've always been very careful about accepting both money and information from any sources that uh, are like the intelligence services, basically. So, you know, if some, some spy came to us with a bag of money and, you know, a bunch of DVDs, we'd you know, say no. So, um, and, you know, it's when Russia is accusing you of being spies all the time, even like, you know, they, they kind of love pl playing kind of six degrees of separation between you and any intelligence services. They'll say, oh, he knows this guy, he knows this guy and this guy, and he worked there and they're the CIA. And that happens like every single day with kind of me and Bellingcat. And we, so we have to be kind of really careful. Also, we're very transparent about our funding. So uh, if you go to bellingcat.com slash about, you'll find all our funders, you'll find a, a yearly audit that we have done on our finances that's done independently, loads of information about how we're run, our governance structure. I also wanted to avoid Bellingcat becoming more of these organizations where, you know, I'm like the king of Bellingcat and everyone else doesn't really matter. And it kind of just you know, becomes very top head heavy. We're actually quite a kind of, um, you know, quite equal organization. I mean, we, our research team and investigators have as much say in kind of how Bellingcat works and operates as, you know, myself as director. We've got a team of directors, we've got a supervisory board who can fire me if they want to. So it's not like a kind of WikiLeaks situation where you have one person who's kind of like the king of WikiLeaks and it all becomes about that. So it's something that we've consciously made a decision to do with Bellingcat. Elliot, thank you ever so much for your time this evening. It has been really, really interesting, um, a bit grim at times as well. Uh, and we've also had a lot of participants here this evening. I think a lot of people have, uh, have logged on and they're very interested. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you if you've asked a question as well, because this has been a really active Q&A session. Um, I'd just like to remind you that Conway Hall Ethical Society is a charity and we have suffered as much as anybody else has during lockdown. So if you've got any money left over after the last year, please do consider making a donation. Meanwhile, the last thing I'll say this evening is thank you very much for your time, Elliot. Bye-bye.